morning. It's so good to see everybody here this morning. I don't know about y'all. I've been excited like all weekend for some reason. I can't figure out why. Um, Today is a big day for Lillington Baptist Church. And if you're with us and you're a first time visitor, we want to get a record of your visit. There's a visitor card in the pew pocket in front of you. Just ask that you complete that and put an offertory plate when it passes by or hand it to an usher after the service. We'd just like to have a record of your visit. Um, we do have a few announcements to go over. Um, first off, the quilt up here by our quilting ministry is for Lloyd DeRamus. Uh, had knee surgery recently and is recovering, so they have made that for him. So just be in prayer for him through his recovery. Um, another big announcement today is Pastor Rick's birthday. So if y'all see him, just wish him a happy birthday. How young is he? <laughs> I think he's 39 and holding. <laughs> Easy, Pastor Paul. <laughs> um, so a few announcements to go over in addition to that. Uh, today we do have uh, Roger Moss and his family with us. He'll be delivering the message. He's our pastoral candidate. Immediately following the service, the church will be called into conference where the church members uh, will be presented or able to vote for Roger to come to Lillington Baptist as our new pastor. Um, while the ballots are being counted, um, Kathy and Bill will be singing some hymns, and then the announcements or the results will be announced before we leave. Um, so that will be following the service. Our other announcements, Operation Christmas Child this past Wednesday, we had a great uh, uh, time with Cindy McPhail, came and spoke to us about Operation Christmas Child. Um, this month we're collecting brushes and combs, um, and then from uh, Susan and Teresa, they, they indicated that some of the other items we've been collecting earlier on, we're falling short a little bit from where we want to be on packing some of those. So if you still have some of the other items they've asked for in the past, please bring them in if you're not able to get out and shop. If you want to donate some money toward it, they'll be glad to go shop for you on that. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Baptist Children's Home Food Roundup, that's going on throughout April. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Women of Living Faith will be Tuesdays at 930 in the Fellowship Hall. Um, I don't know what it is, but I'm always in the wrong age bracket. This past Friday, they had, you know, the children's ministry had a pizza and a movie, had a big time, I heard, had a good attendance. So I was a little too old for that. Well, our next one in here is there's a Senior Adult Fun Day. And I'm too young for that one. Um, <laughs> But that's going to be, uh, it's through Little River Baptist Association. Uh, that's going to be on May 9th from 9 to 12. Their guest speaker is going to be Scott Mason, who's better known as the Tar Heel Traveler. Cost is $10 per person, which includes lunch. So I highly encourage everybody to attend that. Sounds like an exciting time. Um, and then there is also in the bulletin that you'll see a big thank you from Miss Cindy Milton. She's uh, dear church family. Thank you so much for all the prayers, telephone calls, food, and cards following my recent surgery. You have so lovingly ministered to me during this time, and I appreciate you, appreciate, sorry, so much your care and concern. May God rich, bless each of you richly. So um, glad to have Miss Cindy with us always, and she's thankful for us as well. It's just a lovely church. And that, I want to turn it over to Bill and Kathy. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your presence here with us as we gather in your name to exalt you and to worship you. Oh Lord, we join in Paul's prayer for the Ephesians that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you've called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people and your incomparably great power for us who believe. Open our eyes of faith, Lord, that we would see you in your world, in the beauty of your creation, and in one another. Lord, you are beautiful. Help us to seek your face and listen for your voice above all others. Thank you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to worship. Let us pray. God, we come to you with such humble hearts at this point of our service as we think about the wonderful gifts, Lord, that you give us more than we can ever repay in any way to you. We thank you for your generosity to us. As we, as we come to this time of giving, Lord, give us giving hearts, wanting to share the blessings that you've bestowed on us. May we share them with others. We ask you to bless these gifts. 
give us wisdom as we use them that we might lift up your kingdom here on earth in Jesus name amen amen, amen. Uh, good morning. I, you see our eager Rodriguez. That's good. <laughs> uh, the search committee uh, very prayerfully and diligently sought to fulfill the task that you assigned us in finding a pastor, um, one that would lead our church. Uh, and we believe that through God's wisdom and discernment that we have been guided to this person. Roger Moss, uh, he was born in Kings Mountain, North Carolina, uh, here in North Carolina, and he presently lives in Holly Springs with his, his wife and two children, uh, two daughters. He met Debbie while attending UNC Charlotte. Roger went on to complete his undergrad degree in business at Gardner-Webb, and then he was called uh, to serve the Lord, and he finished there with a Master's of Divinity in Christian Education. They have two daughters, which I mentioned earlier. They both have a strong Christian values that is it, is it that we see in their, their parents. Um, Annalise is a student at UNC Greensboro. Um, Kaylee is a junior at um, Holly Springs High School, a rising senior. Roger was ordained in 2001 uh, in Allen Memorial Baptist Church in Grover, North Carolina, and he served as an associate pastor there for, until 2007. Then he was called, uh, felt the call to be an associate pastor at First Baptist Church Hudson, Hudson, North Carolina, until 15. Then in 15, he felt the call to serve as associate pastor at Good Hope. Baptist Church in Cary, where he's presently uh, serving. Roger, through our conversations and through all the information that we've been presented, uh, has a wealth of knowledge of what church is about, what church life is. Uh, he has 24 years of experience in church. Uh, his heart to be a lead pastor was very evident from the very beginning in our interaction with, with Roger. I'm just going to name a few things that I think we probably have shared, but I just think it's important that you hear those today. Uh, his do doctrinal beliefs line up with ours as a church. His experiences speak of him being a team player. He's very mission-minded, so his mission-mindedness lines up, aligns with ours. Uh, he's very self-directing. He can take a vision and see it through to the end, through fruition. Uh, he's a man of integrity that we notice through all of our conversations with all the references and everything. And he is a very uh, strong man in his uh, prayer life. So this morning, the Pastor Search Committee uh, would like to present to you Reverend Roger Moss. Well, I can tell you I've never followed an introduction quite like that before. Um, I do get a little nervous up here, and so so when I came in, I see I see we got flames up here, and I'm kind of like, if I not one of these pieces of paper off, y'all need to run. Um, but just good morning, Lillington. It, it is great to be here. Um, uh, this morning we'll be looking at Philippians 3, uh, chapter 3, 12 through 16. So if you want to find that, go ahead. But I would like to thank the search team just for their hospitality, the love that they have shown uh, myself and my family. Um, throughout this process, it, it has been an incredible process to get to know them as they were getting to know me, and uh, I can look around this morning. I know many of you I saw uh, yesterday uh, afternoon. Uh, it was a good time. I may not have been able to get around to everybody, but I look forward to hopefully seeing uh, and maybe talking to some of you this morning. But there's one thing for sure that I've seen throughout all of this, and that is God at work. 
uh, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we can always look and see how God is at work. And so praying through all this has allowed my faith to grow and my family's faith to grow. So I thank you for that. And when I started in ministry, this text that we look at this morning was vitally important in setting me on the path that God wanted me to take. It's one that uh, every so often um, you wind up in some adventure. Some, you wind up in some situations that you don't expect to find yourself in. And throughout all of that, I know that God's been a part of that. And there's nothing in there that, that I would want to change because of just everything that I've been able to learn. But over time, I've been able to come back to this passage of Scripture, been able to reflect and look at it, and, and it's been able to help me mature in my faith. But one of the personal realizations I had as I was putting it together for this morning was that I realized that uh, Paul, um, as he's writing the letter to the Philippians here, he's been in ministry. He's been doing this for about the same length of time that I've been in ministry. And I look at what he does, and I'm kind of like, wow, that he has accomplished a lot um, and can be a role model, someone that we can look to from Scripture. Paul was writing this letter from prison. Uh, he's writing it to the Christians in Philippi. His prison is kind of what we would might label as house arrest. And so in this situation, he's responsible for taking care of the cost of his upkeep. And... Part of his reliance is on the generosity of the Philippian church. Uh, it is started by people who Paul had led to a personal saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so he writes this letter as a thank you to them for their monetary gift and for uh, their work in the Lord. But he also wanted them to know, hey, I have a probably a little different perspective than you have on my imprisonment. And that's the fact that he's been able to talk with and advance the gospel into other areas, uh, into other people's lives. And so in this letter, he is addressing a few things that are happening in and around the Philippian church. And so this morning, we come to this text, uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 16. Uh, we're going to look at this together. Um, but I am accustomed to wherever I am, uh, asking if you don't mind, just in honor and respect of God's word, if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. If you're able, uh, we'll start at verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this or am already made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything, you think otherwise. God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for inspiring Paul to write this. Lord, we know that as God breathed, we know that there are examples set in this that we can take, we can apply to our lives, we can apply it to the church. Lord, open up our hearts to be receptive to that this morning. Lord, teach us in this time. Lord, there may be things going on with uh, individual people here this morning, and, and they need to lay it at your feet this morning. Give them that opportunity. Give them that relief to be able to turn that over to you. Lord, there may be someone here, this might be the first time they're hearing the gospel. Uh, allow them to take that in and understand what that means for their life. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For me here, Paul makes uh, five points about growing in maturity uh, in, in our faith. And so within each of those, of course, is Paul's uh, purpose for why he is saying it, but in that we can take it and say, okay, how does this apply to us personally, and how can that apply to us as a church? And so that first step is persistence. So that first one's persistence. We see this in Paul's press on statement. Why is he saying that he needs to press on? Well, he's saying, 
I've not yet obtained perfection. I'm not there. He did not want people to look at him and think that he was perfect. As he matured in faith, he realized more and more that he had not yet arrived. And so this goes back from what he was saying in verses 8 through 11 leading up to this, but also evidenced in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. There were some false words that were circulating around about Paul. Um, Don't know specifics of what exactly was being said, but it was by other people who were preaching the gospel message. Uh, It may have been people who were envious of him, or or maybe they viewed each other as, as rivals. But Paul's making the statement out of a place of humility. He's saying, I, I don't see myself as perfect. And so one of the things we need to realize is as we're reading this, we're not specifically told. Paul doesn't write out word for word who his opponents are here, or who maybe he's talking about. But a lot of people seem to narrow this down to a group of people called the Judaizers. And Paul seems to point to that in this part of his letter. But what that group was trying to say is it's Jesus Christ plus something else in order to obtain salvation. And so Paul is saying it's not Jesus Christ plus something else. All right. He's saying what he is doing is he's taking a broad approach. He's looking at everything that is going on around the Philippian church. And he is saying in that moment that. There are other things that are going on. And so even though that's happening, he's also saying there are other issues that are going on. And one of those is this idea of perfectionism. And it was supposed to be, for some people, the key to uh, getting spiritual uh, maturity, attaining that by being perfect. In our society today, we might call that a good enough mentality. Well, I'm good enough. Well, I'm not I'm not like this person over here or that person over there. I've been good and I'm good enough. That type of idea is I've made it. I've arrived. I'm good enough. But Paul contrasts that by pointing to himself and saying, hey, I'm not there yet. And so early on in chapter three, he makes a statement about why some people could actually think that he was perfect based on their standards. But the way Paul sees it now, he says, this is all trash. This isn't anything that I need to be living for. And think about that for just a minute. He's writing to a group of people who are surrounded by that. He is instrumental in building churches and sending letters and and being about God's work. Imagine what that Philippian church is thinking when they are hearing those words for the first time. For the Philippian church, and even for us, what this requires is a proper proper balance of healthy dissatisfaction. Paul's words are indicating, I am not happy with where I am spiritually. This doesn't mean that he hasn't grown in his faith. What he's saying is, there's room to strengthen it. I see things that I can do. And so the same is applied for each of us. We need to look at that. Uh, But there is a warning here. And that warning is don't play the comparison game. Sometimes we might think we're okay when we compare ourselves to other Christians. So when I was in school, I I played soccer. That was my sport of choice. And so in the off season, in order to stay in shape, I'd run track. But I also knew that I needed to improve, so I'd go to some different sports camps to improve some skills, some other things. And then in one of those soccer seasons, I actually received the most improved player. But even then, I wasn't giving up pushing forward. I wanted to get better. But if I compared myself to some of the other players on the team, I knew I was better. But if I compared it to some other people, I knew I wasn't the best. And so the trap here is when we are comparing ourselves to other spiritual people, we may think too highly of ourselves or we may think too low of ourselves and see ourselves in a lesser light. And so Paul says counter this by having a holy, that's H-O-L-Y, holy dissatisfaction with where you are spiritually. Now, how does that help a church? Well, first, the world likes to look at the church and think that we're perfect people. Um, some, 
I don't know if they've just had a run in with people. If there's other things, there's a mindset that is there. But Paul points this out in verse 12, and it needs to be what we point to as a church. Christ Jesus has made me his own. The church must point to him as being the starting point for that relationship. He is perfect. I am not. He is perfect. Nobody in here is perfect. God loves the church more than you and I can ever love it because he is perfect. Even in our imperfections, God looked down and he said, I'm sending my son to you. He's going to die for your sins so that we can have forgiveness of sins. We come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ when we accept that offer. And we can press on through that relationship to continue growing in our faith and making it our own. But as we grow in that, what that means for us as a church is that we should love, we should value gathering together as the church publicly. But also at the same time, we must understand nobody is perfect. But it also means that when we look at that, we need to treat each other in that viewpoint of seeing and understanding. Nobody here is perfect. And to the world who has a different view, that can set a standard to them. They can look at that and they can say, that's really what things should be about. Now, Paul is saying, I've not yet become perfect. But he is looking towards a time when he will. But he says it will not happen until the Lord returns. This likewise should be something that we individually and as a church point toward. And that's the hope that we have in a returning king. That will happen one day. We need to point towards that. But it brings us to our second step, which is passion. Now, Paul doesn't use that word specifically. But he says it by using this phrase, one thing. And that's in verse 13. If I were to ask someone who knew you well, how would they respond to this next question? What is that person's one thing? I'm going to pick on Neil over here for just a minute. If I ask you, if I said, what's Neil's one thing? What would, I'm not asking out loud. He may not want to hear that. But, but, what I, but what I am trying to point towards or what we're trying to figure out is what is that person's singular passion? What's that thing that drives them? And so for Paul, it was easy for him to state. He was able to look at that, and he says, growing in Christ. Paul's always fond of using athletic imagery to describe the Christian lifestyle. And so he is saying, I have a singular focus, which is in front of him, and he says it's the goal line. Now, my family and I were in a car recently during a downpour of rain, and due to some car issues, we have been driving around one of my in-laws' cars. And Debbie was driving. It's, it's downpour. It's all this is coming down. And so she asked the question. She says, have you seen how aggressive these windshield wipers get the water off the windshield? And so I look up. Those things are like throwing it. I mean, it, it got violent. It was throwing water off everywhere. But when I look up, I realize, hey, there is a lack of visibility here. And so I just asked her. I said, are you paying attention to the road or to the wipers? <laughs> of course, she is paying attention to the road. It's just sometimes for us, our Christian walk can be like that. We get distracted by some other things in this life. For me, sometimes that can be social media. I get my phone out. I like seeing what's going on with people. Sometimes maybe some stuff with famous people. I'm just scrolling through things when my mind should be focused somewhere else. Even when I'm doing my personal devotion time, I have to put it on silent. I have to put it out of, out of reach so that I'm not distracted by that. For some of you, it may be that you want to see what's going on in the news and see what the most recent headlines are and see what people are saying about it. But Christ states it this way in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your passions dictate your focus. We should be looking towards the goal line. And when we do, there should be no distractions. But when we don't, 
everything that is around us is going to distract us. Passion in this sense requires a forward motion. We've got to be moving forward. We've got to be concentrating on that one thing at the end. And so for Paul, it was uh, tra the transforming power of the gospel message, what it does in his life, what it does in other people's lives. And so we need to live a transformed life. It should transform how we live now, what we're doing. It's kind of like having those blinders on our eyes like, like maybe they use with horses to keep us focused on the goal, all right, to keep us from getting anxious, to keep us from getting fearful, letting those things set in. And I don't know about you, but I need that almost daily. But when your goal line is that growth and maturity is its prize, it should stir a longing in your heart to do whatever is necessary to improve. Running a race, that requires practice. Put the time in to achieve the goal. Your spiritual growth towards maturity is based on your commitment level, not how old you are as a Christian. Understand that training in this area is going to hurt. When we come to, to reading scripture, we might not like what's revealed because it's doing something on the inside to us. But we're also told in scripture that it's there to correct us, but it's also there to encourage us, to help us grow. Our Lord loves you more than you love yourself. So that key component, don't let distractions get in the way. But you know, churches sometimes are notorious for chasing the next big thing in Christian circles. It could be anything like music, preaching style, ministry. You just put a blank line in there and, and fill it in however you want. But what, you, what a church needs to do is find what they're good at in their ministry setting and specialize in that. God's put a passion in each of you, and that passion may be something that is different for each of us, but he wants, he wants each of you to use those for his betterment of the church. So when we chase that next big thing as a church, we might actually be taking our eyes off the prize at, the, at that goal line that the Lord has set in front of us. However, I've been in enough churches. I've seen enough things going on. I've heard enough stories. Sometimes God calls a pastor. Sometimes God calls a leader. Sometimes God calls somebody into your life maybe to point something out and to maybe confront something that is going on. Don't stand in the way of what the Lord wants to see happen in your life. To put this kind of in racing terms, maybe you're on a new leg of the race or maybe you're off the racetrack entirely and somebody's coming along and trying to bring you and, and help you course correct there. Now, the third step is progress. Some people might label that category as direction. But we're still locked into verse 13 here. We might get a specific mental image when we think about the word progress. I am not talking about being progressive. Both passion and persistence, it will always require progress. Paul's not running backwards in this race. If I were to run backwards, say, I'm stepping on something. I know I'm stepping on something. If I were to run backwards, I could very well trip over myself. All right, I know we're videoing it. It could get viral real quick out on the Internet. All right, after y'all finish laughing at me, some of you might need to come check on me. But Paul, what he's saying is, I understand the pitfalls. If I'm trying to go backwards, it's not going to work. It's, it's not where um, his mindset is at. And so he's saying, don't, don't do that, all right? And so he phrases it uh, this way. Um, he says, forgetting what lies behind. He's saying both passion and persistence, it requires progress. Um, interestingly, there's a commentator, Warren Wiersbe. He says it this way. We are accustomed to saying past, present, future. But we should view time as flowing from the future into the present and then into the past. So when we look forward towards that future goal, it should help us forget what is back here in the past. What has happened has happened. It's in the past. Now, many self-help people will try to get you to think about your past, 
forcing you to view your past as more valuable than your present in order to help improve uh, maybe your future self. Paul goes against this thought by saying, don't overthink it. His issue of telling someone to forget something is different from telling someone to not remember something. This word, let's say you're shackled to the past, it's saying stop letting it have authority over you. He's saying let that be broken. I'm not against anybody seeking counseling. There are people who need that, all right? But they're valuable tools that are there that can help someone through that process. They may even be able to point out some spiritual growth ideas in the midst of that. But always, with anything, weigh it against the backdrop of Scripture and what it has to say. As I mentioned earlier, Paul's writing this letter from house arrest. He has had the kinds of things that have happened to him that might make some of us look at our situation and go, I'm done, I want out. I don't want anything to do with this. But he sees the situation differently. He is showing evidence of a man who is on a mission and who is not wanting to stop where he is spiritually. His accomplishments for the Lord are significant. But he's saying, I'm not bound by them. He's saying they've happened, but I'm not bound to them. He is saying, I'm looking, I'm more intent to look forward in what is happening there so that I can make the most significant impact on growing the Lord's kingdom. But he's also saying, I'm not looking back there at the past sins and viewing myself as unusable for the Lord. What do you think's likely the biggest hurdle for churches and maybe even individuals around this idea of forgetting? Nostalgia. We're happy with where we're at. Our words cause us to reminisce. We may think about the good old days. We may call it the glory days. In a negative sense, sometimes a church might say, well, we've never done it that way before. Or, you know, I remember when, and they're unwilling to let go of the past. This is not to say that a church should ever forget what has got them to this point. What was back there in the past, what got them forward is important, all right? Those things from the past, they're not forever. And so sometimes the gospel message, we get this idea, the gospel message is eternal, but the vehicles in which we use it are temporary. They're temporal. Churches must examine what's going on and see if they're making temporary things into eternal golden calves. And as a pastor, I've got to say, this one has snuck up on me a few times. It's stung and it's hurt because what happens sometimes is that mindset makes us complacent. We put it into coast mode. We just want to coast along. Our previous successes are not a license to stop pressing on toward the goal that the Lord has called us to in the future. Celebrating our successes are important because what happens there is it turns us towards a heart of thankfulness towards the Lord. Now, I've been watching the NCAA tournament. I know it's come to an end. Um, your brackets probably were busted if you fill those out. But in watching that, you know what I didn't really see? Some of those teams didn't say, you know what, we won that last game. We're not going to worry about this next game. They didn't look when they got into the game and say, you know what, we just scored a couple points. We're just going to coast here. No, that's a recipe for disaster. It's going to be the same way with a church. A tendency with the nostalgia mindset is that it can sometimes lead us to thinking it's time for the younger people to take over. And we do need to do that. We need to train them. We need to take that time. But we also need to think through this. We don't ever, ever retire from doing the Lord's work. We don't ever retire from doing ministry. And we do it together as the church. Seasons of life might change, which might cause us to serve the Lord differently. And each season might require us growing in our faith. We can embrace this idea of progress. And when we do, our faith can be stretched in ways that we didn't think were possible. It'll lead us to 
to look forward and grab hold of those chances that the Lord has in front of us, and it shifts our attention to moving forward. Now, the next step is purpose. Paul uses this phrase, I press. He uses it twice throughout. Um, it appears again in verse 14. And so when we see things that are repeated, we need to stop. We need to ask, why, why does he keep saying this? And so he is that man. He's that man that's on a mission who's pressing on toward that goal. Later, Paul says that we should seek to act in similar fashion. His words emphasize the individual drive that each of us should have in seeking out Christ and pointing others to Christ. That reward has eternal uh, prizes that go with that. Each Christian has the same goal at the end of that race. We're going to be called heavenward to be with Christ in the end. Our journey for that, to get to that place, it starts roughly in the same place. We come to an understanding of who Christ is and that we're sinners in need of a Savior. Your personal story of salvation may look different than mine, may look different than other people in here, but at its core is the realization of the importance of Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection for your life and how that carries out. So after making that decision, what does a Christian do? Well, Christ gave us some more words in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Should be familiar to us if we've been in church. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we are to make disciples, baptize them. We're to teach them, to train them. That sounds like purpose to me, laid out fairly clear. So after that, what do we do? Well, 1 Corinthians 12 gives us an answer. I'm not going to read that whole chapter, but I'll sum it up. It discusses Christ being the head of the church and we're the body and that we each have a function to serve. We each function as a different part. Our purpose is to find what that is and to serve effectively. Every Christian should serve. You don't get out of that. You should be serving. Returning to this passage, there's some underlying ideas here that Paul's laying out. We need to have spiritual role models. Paul says, I'm not running this race alone, but I, I know there are other people running this race with me, but they're not running my race. Examples are important. And so Paul knew that there were people in Philippi who were trying to tell them, hey, you've got to live this lifestyle. You've got to live this different example. And when people follow those false examples, they lose sight of that goal that's there at the end. And our purpose is only going to be achieved through the graciousness of the Lord. God empowers us for his purpose. Whatever that purpose is, he's going to empower us. But at the same time, it tells us that the Lord is the judge of the race. And so one day we're going to meet the Lord face to face. And if you made that decision, you made Christ your own. If you've taken that on, you will hear when you stand face to face with him, well done, good and faithful servant. But if you're not, you'll hear these words. Well, uh, you'll hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. There is a purpose to this life. Don't let other things distract you. If, you're, if you've got your eyes on that goal, don't be looking around everywhere and behind you. Focus. Narrow that in. Paul sets the example, and that's kind of what he's pointing to. Look, look at what's going on in my life. He's trying to say, I'm a role model for you. Look, look at that. He's not saying that arrogantly. He's saying it humbly. But he wants nothing more than to capture that prize at the end of the race. And so his attention is fully given to that task. And by so doing, he says, whatever this is back here that is shackling me, the Lord can break it and allow me to press on toward that goal that he wants. So our first four steps in growing in spiritual maturity are persistence, passion, progress, and purpose. They have to all work together. Passion and persistence usually work hand in hand to help move you forward. 
And then you're able to see that progress. You're able to achieve purpose. But there is a key component to all four of those. Maybe you've picked up on that. And that final step is practice. Allow me to reread verses 15 through 16 for us. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything, you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul's telling the Philippians that if they want to grow in spiritual maturity, there's a certain mindset, a certain way of thinking he wants them to put into practice. He's saying, I want you to practice everything I've said up to this point. Christians cannot call themselves perfect because we have to view ourselves as imperfect. And if you're imperfect at something, it requires practice. We're presented with a type of paradox here. Christians must realize that they're never going to reach perfection on this side of heaven. But imperfection doesn't give us an excuse to say, I'm not going to run that race. Each Christian is running the race. We all have the same goal at the end. God has orchestrated this, but in the end, you have a choice of what you will do and how you will respond. I believe the goal of Paul's words in these two verses hammers home a a critical quality of practicing the Christian lifestyle, and that is unity. We have to practice unity to achieve maximum potential personally and as a church. Churches are always going to have differences. It's it's just part of the nature of being human and part of uh, a body of believers. And I've been in different churches. I've seen different things happen. I've seen people have different thoughts on issues. But what Paul is saying is I want you to have unity on the major points while recognizing that there might be some differences on those minor things. If Paul were alive today, he might actually say, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. He says, God will reveal this to you also. When we practice what we learn from the Lord, God is going to reveal how to handle those situations when maybe things might differ. All right, we shouldn't abandon our unity with other believers or with a church because there's a difference. What that says is when we value that, it says what I'm thinking, what I want to do is more valuable than what God has going on in that moment. Spiritual maturity put into practice requires unity, and it is highly valuable for a church. It sets an example to the rest of the world. People will see us as different, and that is a good thing. But also, know as we practice this, as we put it into practice, it may require from time to time, you may see another believer a fellow believer something is going on and you need to maybe have a conversation with them because you know that's not the lifestyle you need to be living but what you need to do in order to help maintain unity with that believer is have that conversation in love not judgmentalism turn what paul states into a prayer for that believer i would say it goes something like this god please reveal the truth of this to that person But also, in that same prayer, pray for yourself, asking God to reveal any misunderstanding you might have about that situation. And so when we put that into practice, what we're doing is not letting our emotions like anger or frustration dictate action until we take it to the Lord first. And so Paul's statement in verse 16 helps us consider that point. He, he is using the word us because he says this is valuable enough. It's me. I'm, I'm injecting me into this. And so as a, as a pastor, I too have to put these things into practice. Anytime I step out of line and I'm not practicing spiritual maturity or I'm not practicing something that we believe, let's have a civilized conversation about it. I should not think that I fully arrived just because I'm a pastor or think that I'm fully mature because of whatever reason, because I've been in church all my life or anything like that. But I can tell you what does bother me as a pastor. As it was said earlier, I've been in church for 24 years. It shocks me how quick 
a congregation member, how quick a staff member, or how quick a pastor might fire off a text or an email because they think something's out of line. Name it, whatever it is. They just think something's out of line. They fire something off. And what I find a lot of times in those situations is that people have not fully processed their thoughts or they don't have the full story of everything that is is going on. Or worse yet, they just feel safer behind a keyboard. And that's incorrectly practicing what Paul is trying to get across here. He's saying don't, don't refrain from the progress. All right, come together, grow together. Don't abandon what you know to be true. And our race starts when we become a Christian. Your growth on that front end, it might be slower if you're a new Christian. And others might be on the track somewhere else looking towards that prize that's there at the end. Be joyous. Have a heart of joy that there are others running the race that you're running. Learn from them. Teach them. Share with them. And in doing so, you can help them along on their journey as you take all five of those and you and you put them into your life. Now, I'm, I'm going to close out here. Uh, God offers redemption of sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've talked through a little bit about that. But I have an important question for us. Have you decided to follow Christ as Lord and leader of your life? That's how you start this faith journey that we've been talking about this morning. And that question, there are only two answers to that question. Either you say it's not true and it's foolishness, or you say, I'm in need of that, and I'm in need of the forgiveness of sin that is offered through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, resurrection. All right, that question demands an answer. And if that is the day for you, I'm going to be down here, down front. I would love to talk with you through that decision. Um, But there may be others here today. Maybe something has sparked for you. Maybe you need to come forward. Maybe you need to pray. I'm going to say this altar up here is open. If you if you need to talk to me, if I if you want somebody to pray with you, I'm I'm open to that also. We can pray together. Um, or take time. Pray at your seat too. But put it into practice. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity this morning. Lord, sometimes when we think through and we want to process your word, we know there are changes that we need to make. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out how to make those changes. Where's the first place to start? But Lord, if we ultimately we believe that you're leading, you're, you're leading us towards that goal line, you're going to reveal that to us. Lord, I ask for direction within Lillington, I ask for direction in my own life. Lord, there may be people here who are struggling this morning with things that, that we don't even know or, or maybe it's things they're struggling with that they, they don't even understand. Open them up to be receptive to you this morning. And by all means, Lord, if there is someone here that doesn't know you and they've not made that decision, may today be that day. We give you all praise and all glory. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.